We're going to talk about um, what you saw. A lot of people that, that are, are not clients got a, a flyer, but uh, we're going to start actually with, with the subject that a lot of my clients have been asking about lately. A lot of the stuff I talk about, as, as you guys know, is, is what I'm getting from clients. And what I'm getting from my clients when they come in is a lot of these subjects. So maximizing inheritance through wealth transfer, what's going on with the changes in the 401k laws, how interest rates, of course, we're all talking about interest rates, how they're going to affect your portfolios, your market retirement, are interest rates going higher? Uh, we're going to talk about that. Do recessions uh, make markets crash? Because everybody's talking about recession, soft landing, light landing, hard landing. Um, could the government shut down, destroy markets? And we all know uh, coming up November 15th, sounds like the new Speaker of the House, Johnson, may want to push it out to January. He's dealing with somewhat of a bifurcated um, uh, caucus in the Republican Party. So what does a long shutdown mean to the dollar? And that's really what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the reasons why I invited some new people here is the most popular investments in the retirement community are annuities. Are annuities a good investment? And of course, that includes private equity and even, um, even whole life insurance. And then we'll, we'll end with um, some of the things that we're doing at the firm. I think that makes sense. Okay, so did you not get that working, young man? Okay, maximizing your inheritance to wealth transfer. Let's just get into that. Uh, could you give me the clicker? I'll see if I can get it to work. Okay, this is something that really came about only because over the last six months or a year, I've had a lot of my clients, not a lot, I've had two or three clients pass and the estate turns into Armageddon. Uh, the kids fight over the inheritance. That's, there's nothing worse. I can't think, of, I can't imagine anything worse than having my kids never talk to each other after I pass. I just, and it kills me. It kills me because I've known some of these clients for 20, 30 years. They, they pass and then their, their kids just go to war over the estate. And it's just interesting because this is exactly what my mom says. Oh, I'll let you kids fight over it. I'm like, mom, that's not a good idea. I'm in this business. That's not a good idea. And so what you have is it usually turns into a lawsuit. Um, I'll tell you a, a quick parable when I get through this list, and uh, this makes me angry. Uh, a quick parable is um, give copies and wills and trusts to all your children. That's, that's just a basic idea, and I don't know what, if it's generational. I really don't, that the gener your generation just doesn't want to tell your kids what you're worth. And I know when I was growing up, before I became a financial planner, my, I didn't know 10, 15 years in, my parents started to share, you know. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a big basic first step. Ask your children to give you details of, of their personal list. Some kids may want a picture, you know, they don't want to be fighting over some stupid thing, you know, some vase or something. Uh, and, and write it down. Put into all documents a non-contest clause. Well, that means that you're going to get one child that's going to contest the will or trust your written out. So now you don't, uh, I'm going to sue, I don't think it's right. Now this is an important one, and this is one that came up because it's a real situation that happened with us. Um, I, had, I had clients, he passed, left his wife a good amount of money. I mean, you know, almost like into the high six, seven figures, no, seven figure. And... Like like a lot of like a lot of grandmothers, they tend to overspoil their grandkids, and they. I was looking at at you know I remember Brianna who was my assistant at the time. She was looking at the account and she'd come in and say you know, she's really blowing through that estate. So I called her in and I says, hey, Tony left you more money than you'll ever need for the rest of your life. Well, my grandson needs a house, and my granddaughter needs a new car, and I says, yeah, and my daughter needs this and that and this. Well, to make a long story short, she really spent down her state. She really had nothing left other than her home, and her home lived in a nice part of town. Her home was worth a couple of mil. Just before she passes, one of the daughters gets a change in the trust that bequeaths the home to the daughter. All of a sudden now, the two sons are like, we're suing. So by putting this clause into the, into the document, you can't do that sort of that deathbed change in the, in the will and the trust. And, and you know, 
All you really need is a couple of witnesses and you could have a napkin and you could, you know, the, you, you could get the wishes of somebody. But if you put something like this in a document, then that can't happen. And that's really just something that came up in my practice and I thought I'd bring it up. List all children as co-trustees. When you have a trust or will, all kids say, okay, sign off on everything. Is it cumbersome? Yeah. Is it a pain in the neck? Yeah. But the world we live in, with DocuSign, not a problem. So I don't think it's really, it's really a problem. Uh, transparency and communication, that's really all we're really looking at on that one. So, you know, Vinny, I have another clicker in the bag there. If you can grab it, that would be great. I don't want to do this the whole time. Um, so anyway, give me a second. I'm going to try another. It worked fine. Let's see. This is a brand new clicker, too. Is clicker detectable? I don't think it is. Oh, it's working. Uh, it's working. I'm not sure. Are you an engineer? <laughs> Steve, good to meet you. Uh, so any, anyway, guys. All right, so anyway, let's talk about living trust and estate planning. Uh, I worked with, in my career, I've worked with so many attorneys. Is anybody here an attorney? Is anybody an attorney? So I can tell attorney jokes? No. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I won't tell attorney jokes then. No. Uh, oh, okay, retired attorneys. Uh, no, I love attorneys. I got some of my best friends are attorneys. Uh, now, the, the, the thing about attorneys is that here's what I find as, as, as a money manager. I have um, attorney will write a trust, will write a trust, give you a book that looks like the Bible. And essentially, a lot of it, not all attorneys, but I find some attorneys won't really communicate because the client will come in and go, well, we got this, you know, we, we have a trust. And it's like, okay, great. We have to fund the trust. We have to make sure you're a uh, quick claim the house. We got to put all your investments in the trust. Oh, what do you mean? Or whatever. They don't, I don't know that there's a lot of afterthought on that. But what happens is upon the passing, and I see this so much in my practice, upon passing, the, the, essentially the kids kind of don't know what to do. And Mal, you know this because you get that call and they say, well, what do they do? They look, they look at the bottom and see who wrote the trust, and then they see blah, 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 Esquire, and they call the attorney, uh, which the attorney says, yeah, I'll be more than happy to handle the estate. And they spend thousands of dollars when the reason they wrote the trust was to avoid attorney costs. So it's like, oh, my own. So, so it's, it's frustrating. So, you know, what I tell you guys, and I've said it before, just come in. That's, you know, unfortunately, what do we say, Mal, our average client age is... 85, okay. So unfortunately, we're, we're really good at this. And I'm not happy about it. But uh, anyway, what type of, of trust will make sense? Trust is fully funded. All appropriate accounts are labeled correctly. All real estate is quick claimed into the trust. All assets out trust are either POD or TOD. Now, what's interesting, in the state of Colorado, there's 27 states that do allow your home to be either POD, paid on death, or transfer on death. Not all states, but, but 30 states do. So what does that mean to you guys? That means that if you don't have a trust, or it's not joint tenants, then what happens is at the death of the second spouse, you don't want to probate, but you don't have to probate if you just go to the county and listen, I could come, I can give you guys a quit claim deed. You just, I could print it out for you and you can go to the county and you can hand it to the, the clerk and just put, you know, uh, Susan Bean paid on death the kids, to her kids, right? Uh, so, so that's simple and that's nice. You know, it's interesting. I was in Florida. My mom lives in Tampa. My mom's going to be 89. And I'm just, I'm going to go see her soon. But um, I, I went down to visit my mom last time and my mom has a trust. And I said, Mom, I need to make some changes to your trust. And I went to a notary and uh, walked into the bank, and I go, yeah, I need to make some changes. He go, no, in the state of Florida, any changes to any uh, trusts or wills must be done by an attorney. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So i got to pay an attorney $300 to stamp a document? Well, I ended up overpaying <laughs> the, uh, the well, it wasn't the banker, actually. It was another, so I said, what if I gave you an extra 100 bucks? She goes, okay. So she did it. But... So anyway, you know, I realize, I realize the attorneys want to protect their, their turf. Detailed instructions to your children step by step to handle without an attorney. So that's what we want to do. I want to talk a little bit about uh, credit shelter trusts. Everybody that I've advised on trusts in this room, and I know 
John and Carlisle. Uh, these are, I, I even think, John, we talked about it, is, is the two most, unfortunately, I think divorce rates are up to 60, 62 percent. I, I know it's pretty high. And then, of course, we're in a very litigious environment. So it's, I really like, I really like the generation skip or the, sh the credit shelter. Now, I'm going to just give you an example of it. And counselor, if, if I got it wrong, let me know. But the bottom line is, is that if when I die and I leave my money to my children, um, my children then own it, okay? And of course, inherited property in Colorado isn't part of the marital estate unless they commingle it. In other words, they put it in a joint account with their, with their spouse. But what if I left the money in trust to my children? In other words, my children weren't the owners, they were the trustee, they, were, they owned the key. So, so that's interesting, because if I left it, let's say I left it to my son John, and John basically says, okay, Dad, thank you for this money, you're gone, but the ultimate beneficiary is, is, is his kids, then what happens is that John doesn't own the money, but John is the trustee. John can invest it. John can take income. John has what we call ascertainable standards, and that's health, education, support, maintenance. Well, it was interesting. I was at a, I was at a meeting with an attorney, and I said, can you explain support to me and maintenance? And he said, well, do you remember Jackie Kennedy Onassis? I go, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember, you know, remember who she was. Well, she had to maintain her lifestyle, so under her trust, she would buy a Bentley every year. And therefore, she was able to take money out of the trust to maintain her lifestyle. So you can see what's nice about that is, is that if John, who owns a business, is anyway sued because, let's say, somebody falls off, you know, in his building, John Homburger, right? You own a bunch of buildings, what I'm saying, right? Real, one of your real estate properties. What happens is the 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 they can't go after that trust because he doesn't own the money. The money is owned by the, the, the heir, the persterpes, the bloodline, if you will, of, 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 of the children. And I, I think, now, there are some positives and negatives to that. It does protect against lawsuit. It protects against, trust maintains complete control of the asset under ascertainable standards. Now, if you get too aggressive, could the attorney... The uh, assuming attorney maybe attack that. Uh, beneficiaries are the owner, but not the trustee. Trust, you can put special power appointment uh, based on some of the attorneys I work with said you could put something in the document that says you can actually change the beneficiary, which I found interesting. I said, but then how is it irrevocable? Do you need an attorney for a trust? This is controversial. I'll give you a quick little vignette. I, I had a client get a trust done by an attorney. She comes to my office and says, Dom, I paid $5,000 for this document, but my name's not on it. Some other person, you know, Jane Doe. I go, so what, what, what does that mean? Was the attorney just, you know, cutting and pasting the paralegal and charging? I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not saying that was being done. But so what happens now is, is the documents, I mean, you can, you can get some of these documents through uh, what's that thing that I forget? OJ's attorney started that business uh, uh, trust documents or whatever. But there's there's software programs that you can do. So a lot of times you may not need the attorney for a lot of these kinds of trusts. The 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 it does offer a lot of positives. The surviving spouse does get rights under ascertainable standards, flexibility, uh, protection. And that's good. There are some negatives though. Well, they're costly, but if you have a son or a daughter that's really good with the computer program, okay, and you come in to see me, I've been doing this 35 years, I'm not an attorney, but I've read enough of these documents that I could say, okay, in the software, let's not do this and let's not do that. I, I'm not an attorney, but you could write your own legal documents, okay? I'm not saying everybody here should be an attorney. Uh, the other thing is surviving spouse has limited control. It all depends how it's written, and so I want you to think about that. Uh, you do have support, maintenance, health, education. We know what that is, support, maintenance. There's a gray area, and then, of course, you can get income. I think that is a misnomer, but it is cumbersome. Uh, I have had clients come to me after their parents died and said, 
hey, I have to fill out another tax return every year on this trust. I go, yes, but your parents did it because they felt like they didn't like your wife. And number two, um, if you get sued. So that's kind of the idea behind that. So yes, yes, yes. You're going to pay an, uh, an accountant more money. That is absolute. And it is irrevocable. It's irrevocable. That's why you have protection. That's why you have protection. That's why you can't get sued. So I'm a big fan of it. I've been doing this a long, long time. It's something to think about. Uh, so I thought I'd bring that up. Okay. Let's talk about real quickly some of the changes in the 401k. Secure Act 2.0, a relatively new law. It basically says, if you, and number one, if you're still working, you don't need to take money out of your 401k. So, and people, guess what's happening in your generation? People are not quitting their job. People are, are working till they're 70, 75. John, you're what, 98? Okay, where are you? <laughs> Pretty close. Well, uh, so the bottom line is that's nice. So you don't have that, you don't have to pull money out of that, what we call required minimum distribution. And by the way, the RMD is going up to 75. Carlisle, we just talked about that a couple days ago. Uh, Janice does not have to take money out of her retirement because of new secure, and that just reduces, right? That's taxable income. Unless you give it directly to charity, then that's a benefit, which a lot of my clients do. Penalties are gone down from 50 to 25. So now, you know, client would forget, oh, gee, well, you're going to get it with 50% surtax on that money you didn't take, but now it's down to 25. I'm not sure why the IRS did that, but they did. Uh, and I, I'm a big fan of rolling over your 401k. Why? Your 401k has maybe eight, 10 choices. They're not the best. They're maybe mutual funds. Maybe it was to an insurance company. Why not roll it to a, a self-directed where you have more choices, more of an opportunity, right? So anyway, there, there's, there's, there's reason why you don't, because if you start a new job, you can roll it to another 401, but why would I want to go in another 401? It's, there's no benefits. There's no, they're not going to match on that money. So I don't, I don't really see any benefit, ladies and gentlemen.